so everybody can hear us. <laughs> okay, you guys are studio, the studio group, right? Hi, Michael. Nice. How's it going? <laughs> okay, so just so everybody's not confused, what's happened here? Can everybody hear us, or do we need a microphone? Can you move in a little bit? Okay. Can everybody hear us? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. What's happened here is that two tours have ended up being here at the exact same time, and we're pretty much covering the same kinds of material. So we thought we would just sort of join forces. Um, the so reason, and the reason we're covering the same material is because the river tour we're doing is the river tour that Jenny and I, who are old friends, invented 10 years ago. So we know each other's stick, and we used to do these tours as partners. And then we got too busy, we had to split off and do our own thing. So now our competing tours are back together. So. Right. So we figured we could either do dueling tours this morning, basically, the same and, thing. and like stand ten feet away from each other and see who like most of the people gravitate towards, or we could just um, join up. So I'm Jenny Price. Uh, Sharon already introduced me, and this is Alan Loomis, who's a wonderful architect and urban designer, <coughs> and also very very knowledgeable about the river. So we thought what we would do is I would give you my uh, and and just to know say what we're doing today on our tour. Um, we're just going to do two stops. This will be our real walking stop, and we'll give you an introduction to the river here and talk a little bit about where we are now, and then we'll give you lots of time to walk and really like get into the river, go scuba diving if you want, whatever, because now you've signed the waiver. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and Alan's going to talk to you a little bit about, I think, well, whatever he wants to talk to you about, and also maybe this site in particular yeah. and why it's so green and, and nice here. I actually saw a bird nest. Um, you can't see it from here, but there was a bird sitting on this little hillock right in the middle of this sort of concrete. So there's a lot of life happening here. Yeah. Um, so I thought, um, does that sound good? Yeah, so Same for my students. students, this is the longest stop we'll be at. Um, as, a kind of, as Jenny said, we do this as a walking stop. So if you kind of don't want to bother listening to either tell oh, yeah, yeah. or explain everything, you can wander down, down to the water, down to the water, Usually the walk is down to the footbridge and back, so don't go any further than that, otherwise we'll lose you. So if you just kind of get bored and you just want to take pictures, go ahead and wander off. Jenny and I, when we started doing this, the whole point of doing these tours was to get people to the river, to see the water, to get close to it, to experience it, um, and not to listen to us talk. Right. So, so feel free to wander. Um, and just for my group, the other stop is going to be the Aurel Seco Confluence. It looks very, very different from here probably uh, one of these most important spots historically in Southern California. So that's why we're going to that one. And they're also going to the conflict next. So, so we'll see how this works. <laughs> we can sit on either side of the road. Okay, so um, I have this uh, introduction to the river because I just want to give you kind of the framework for how to think about what's going on with revitalization. Can everybody hear us okay? Might want to come in even a little bit closer. Um, if not, I'm happy to use the microphone, so just let us know. Um, so it takes me about 10 minutes. This is by far the longest I, I talk at any stop, just because I want to give you guys a sense of, of what's going on and why it's important. So let me see how quickly I can do it um, so that you can go walking down and scuba diving. Um, so the river, uh, the LA River is the reason that LA exists, okay? So if you think of all your favorite things in Los Angeles, my nephews would say In-N-Out Burger, you know, whatever, would not exist without the Los Angeles River. Um, Los Angeles um, is a river basin. It's actually a land of rivers and streams. That's not how we usually think about it. But we have three major mountain ranges, and the river drains uh, major parts of all three mountain ranges, and it runs 51 miles. If you look at these brochures here, all the way through the valley and takes a right turn here at the end of Griffith Park, and goes past Griffith and Elysian Parks, along the east side of downtown, along the 710 corridor into the ocean at Long Beach. It is the central artery of the major watershed that Los Angeles inhabits. And it's one of the best water sources in all of Southern California. So that's why in 1769, when the explorers were coming up, they wrote in their journals, they said, we ran into this beautiful river, this well-watered valley, this gorgeous spot. It's the best spot we've seen for settlement so far uh, on our trip from Mexico. And that's why in 1781, the Pueblo was founded at the spot on the river that has the best above ground year-round supply of water. And I think Alan will talk to you about why that's true in a sec. Um, so, uh, and that's our second stop. Okay. So it's, um, it's the reason that LA exists. It's also the reason LA was able to grow into a city. Uh, LA relied on the river and it, the aquifers underneath, the groundwater underneath is its only source of water until 1913 when we decided that we preferred other people's water. Okay. <laughs> 
So it's a central natural fact of LA. It's a central historical fact of LA. It runs 51 miles through the heart of the LA area. Everyone in LA has seen it many, many, many times. Most people in the country have seen it because of all the filming that goes on there. It's really kind of an extraordinary river. The most extraordinary thing about this extraordinary river, most people can't tell you where it is. Okay? So we are a city that has essentially lost our river. And look at that thing. How do you lose something that's as big as that? It's really kind of an extraordinary thing to do. We've lost our river. Um, so how does a city lose its river? Like, I'm from St. Louis. I grew up in the suburbs. We didn't necessarily go to the Mississippi, but we weren't like, we have a river? There's a Mississippi <laughs> River? You know? So how does that happen? Um, the river actually poses one of the greatest flood dangers of any river in American city. That seems odd. I know there's not a whole lot of water in it, but um, a winter like the one we've had, um, the river, uh, it basically this is a really uh, big place if you want to build a city, the LA Basin, it's a tiny, tiny place for all that drainage we get. And the river falls uh, 30 feet per mile and it's 50 miles, the Mississippi falls a foot per mile. So all that water just comes roaring into this basin, okay? Now this became more of a problem uh, through the 20th century as we paved the city, the city grew. In the 1930s we had a series of floods that had people canoeing all over Los Angeles. Sounds fun, right? Um, and the city brought in the Army Corps of Engineers and they said, hey, we know how to solve your flooding problem. We're going to build you a 51 mile, three sided concrete trench, 20 to 30 foot deep, and we're going to stick your river down into it. And it took them about 25 years to do that. Huge, huge, huge public works project to do that to the river and all the tributaries. And the reason they can do that is because we're no longer relying on the river for our water. So, what's the standard explanation for why we decided we prefer other people's water in 1913? Right? You can make money. You can make money. Everybody's seen Chinatown. <laughs> Anybody else? If you had asked William Mulholland, and if you asked most people today, they would say, Los Angeles is a desert. And we outgrow our water supply. So everybody has to repeat after me. I make everybody on all my tours do this. And if you don't do it with conviction, I'm going to make you do it again. All right? LA is not a desert. Can everybody please say that? LA is not a desert. Okay, you were fine. Everybody else was a little iffy. <laughs> and you can thank this person here for me not making you do it again. Okay. I'm Susanna. This is Susanna. Okay, thank you, Susanna. Um, LA has a semi arid Mediterranean climate. Historically, this was actually quite green and wet. Um, and uh, what happened instead, really, is that we did offer our water supply, but only because we had drained the water through unbelievably wasteful water use, and we had treated it as a sewer and a trash dump. Okay. So, um, we built this channel, and it created a few problems. Now, the rest of the story, which I'll try to do in five minutes, I think I've got about five minutes left, left is um, how does paving your river screw up your city in really phenomenal ways, and how does unpaving your river unscrew up your city? in really impressive ways as well, okay? Um, how does it screw up your city? Uh, first of all, ecological problems. We've taken the river, we've cut it off from its river basin. The river can no longer replenish the soils with nutrients, aquifers with water, beaches with sand. That's why they're hauling sand from the valley onto the Malibu beaches. Then the people from Malibu say, it's the wrong color. <laughs> it's the wrong color. So um, they said that about a lot of things. Um, so uh, at the same time, they had the brilliant idea of connecting all the storm sewers into the river. So the river now drains all the pesticides and fertilizers and copper brake bits and everything off of a heavily populated 834 square mile watershed. And all of our infrastructure is designed to get all that crap really efficiently into the river and out to the ocean. And that's why we have some of the dirtiest beaches in the country and some of the dirtiest ocean waters. Now it did solve the flooding problem, but how did it solve the flooding problem? By dramatically exacerbating the flooding problem, because like I said, all of our infrastructure is designed to get our water as fast as possible into the river. So we're now pouring up to like 80 to 90 percent in a really big rain into the river, and it used to be about 8 percent. So we're containing the floods, but we're actually making them up to 10 times worse. Okay. So those are the ecological problems. Social problems. Um, since at least the turn of the century, Los Angeles has had the least park space per capita. Of any, okay, you cannot have healthy communities and healthy neighborhoods without park space and green space and connecting space and public space, all of which were terribly deficient in. And of course, these problems are by far the worst in the poorest neighborhoods, some of where you could walk for three miles and not see a public park. Is anybody from another city like I am? Wow, everybody else is from LA? Cool. Can you walk three miles and not see a public park? Not in Berkeley. Not in Berkeley. Oh, well, okay, Berkeley. <laughs> Maybe that's not yeah, the it's best. Yeah. yeah, it's perfect. But anyway, um, so this is a huge uh, uh, issue.
And then finally, um, it's a water supply problem. This is how we manage our water in LA, which, where we have a semi-arid climate. Okay, it's not Portland. Um, we take all the water that get we, we get from the sky for free. What's that called? Alan, Rain. Man, you, you have a <laughs> You guys can see what's what you have, you know, to look forward to. This is great. Okay, so um, rain and all of our infrastructure, all the gutters and the driveways and the streets and everything is designed to get our water as fast as possible into the storm sewers, into the rivers, and out into the ocean. So we're using our local water supplies to literally water the Pacific Ocean. Okay, literally. And then just the city of LA spends a billion dollars a year to import 200 billion gallons of water. It's 20% of our energy use from watersheds all across the West through three series of aqueducts and significant social and ecological damage to those watersheds. So it makes no sense. Um, there's also a cultural problem, which is that we've essentially lost the river. It no longer is part of our collective spirit of place, our understanding of the place that we live and the ecology of that place. Okay, so if you think about it, how does paving your rivers screw up your city? It's deeply, deeply implicated in every, in almost all of the problems that LA is notorious for. Severe uh, environmental degradation, um, really serious social inequities, and our kind of unseemly desire for the rest of the West's world. Okay? So that's the bad news, and that's a lot of bad news. The good news I'm going to do quickly because we're actually focused more on the good news in general and at the next stop, but. Um, the good news is that if you unpave your river, it can really help you grapple with those problems. And what I tell people on my tours is that um, revitalizing the river isn't primarily about the river, it's really about Los Angeles and about grappling with these problems. So very, very quickly, and then I'm going to turn it over to Alan. Um, to revitalize the river, you got to green it, you got to clean it, you got to take up some concrete. To green it, you create a 51-mile greenway and bikeway through the heart of Los Angeles County that's the logical backbone for an entire county-wide network of greenways and bikeways huge consequences. Okay. Um, to clean it, you can't just pluck out the uh, shopping carts and the pesticides and the Prozac and the estrogen supplements. Is everybody happy? We're all on Prozac. Um, you gotta uh, you gotta sort of think holistically, like why do we rely, rely on these thousands of chemicals, you know, in our houses, in our on our bodies, in, on our lawns. It's all ending up in the air, in the water, in our bodies. Um, to clean it, uh, I'm sorry, to take out some concrete, basically what we have to do, if we took out concrete now, we'd be canoeing all over Los Angeles again in the winter like we just had. Okay, so, we have to start capturing our water instead of using it to water the Pacific Ocean. So you can do that with all kinds of infrastructural means. you got to retrofit all those gutters and driveways and, you know, so that it all throws water into green space rather than on concrete. And green space, uh, park space, public space, wetlands restoration. Um, green up all these concrete spaces in LA. Um, and I should have said, the good news starts, I completely uh, missed, this is a Folar tour, in 1985 with the establishment of Friends of the Los Angeles River, and they say, let's green up the, you know, let's revitalize the LA River, and people say, you know, we have a river? Right, exactly. <laughs> and then they say, you know, oh, yeah, right, you're nuts. Um, but um, by basically by about 2000, pretty much every constituency you could possibly think of, public, private, is saying, you know, this is something we really want. So um, it has really potentially very, very huge consequences for LA, and there's uh, lots of different sized projects going on, medium, small, tiny, huge, large, and we'll talk about some more of those um, the rest of the day, but I, want, I know Alan has good things to say, so okay. we'll so, uh, Just to explain where we are, this is the Glendale Narrows. This is one of the three spots in the LA River that's not totally on all three sides in case of concrete. The first spot is it's Pulvita Basin, which is kind of where the 405 and it's 130, 101 at that point uh, intersect. There's a very large dam there that's actually a dam for holding back rainwater behind that. The LA River, even though it's still channelized in a kind of man-made straight line corridor, um, is water on both, or has no concrete on both sides. So if you want to go see the river in a completely natural, kind of quasi-natural state, that's the place to do it. Um, Repeat that area again? Where? Sepulveda Basin, up by uh, near Van Nuys. Yeah. Um, there's a very large recreation area there, a couple of golf courses, model airplane, runway, that sort of stuff. It's, it's probably on the brochure, too. Um, uh, there's, interestingly enough, there's also Tillman Water Reclamation Plant is there. I'll talk about that in a moment. The next spot for no con or limited concrete is here. It really starts right about here. 
that's the five mile stretch of the river between Griffith Park, which is here, down to the Legion Park, which is more or less our next stop. Um, in a moment, I'll explain why there's no concrete on the bottom, although there's concrete on the sides. And then finally, if you go all the way down to the end of the river where it dumps out onto the Pacific Ocean near Long Beach, um, the concrete starts to erode there because you get into the natural estuary. So one of the reasons we come to this spot is because for many years, because there was no concrete on the bottom, trees would grow up, uh, would start to grow in the river bottom. And if you were interested in saying like the LA River could be a nice place, this was the place to come because it sort of looked like it might be a river. So a lot of river restoration efforts started on this stretch because you could walk by and say, well, yeah, I guess I can imagine this is a real river. So this, road, this string of parks that we're walking, are gonna walk down, um, is some of the first little mini pocket parks that were built on the LA River. Um, they were done by Northeast Trees, and Northeast Trees took a rather innovative approach. They used a lot of at-risk youth to work on these parks. Um, so they're engaged in not only building parks, but also the kind of social equity, social justice side of it as well. Um, it's, they haven't been particularly well maintained over the past like 15 years since they were put in, 12 or 15 years. Um, when Jenny and I first started doing tours, they were very beautiful. They've been sort of eroding over time. But you're going to see occasionally, now they're tagged, but as you go down, you're going to see um, little plaques. It was, uh, originally, when they were designing this, they thought that they would do this like route as a kind of exercise route. Um, calisthenics and stuff in the local neighborhood said, no, we don't want to do that. Um, because that might attract, attract gang members who are going to work out. So they said, well, what if it's a bunch of yoga poses? And then, so, the Kerm Yoga. Gangs don't. Gangs don't do yoga. So, um, anyways. On the other side of us is the bike path, um, the dedicated bike path that it runs this entire length and it's being slowly connected. The dream is that there'll be a bike path, as Jenny said, on the river from the mountains down to the sea. Um, and through downtown. So why is Glendale Narrows one of the spots without uh, concrete on the bottom? Well, you have to understand a little bit about the way the LA River works as a hydraulic system. It's an upside down river. Most rivers, if you're like from like Colorado, the Rockies, uh, someplace else, start by water, like snow, sort of slowly melting way up in the mountains and then they turn into streams and it slowly runs all downhill and out to the ocean. The Los Angeles River actually starts from underground, especially in the dry season. Um, there's effectively no river in the dry season. If you were to come here without the city being built, there'd be no river during the dry season because there's no rain, no real river. Um, so anyways, the river, what happens is in the winter, when you have these massive, massive rains and flooding, all that water would settle across like the entire Sepulveda Basin and then sort of slowly percolate through marshland down into the aquifer. So there's a very large aquifer under Los Angeles, in fact. That aquifer in the San Fernando Valley, like the valley itself, basically slopes south. As it slopes south and that water runs south, it hits the granite rock of the Santa Monica Mountains and is forced above ground. So the route of the LA River is east-west, across the like south base of the uh, San Fernando Valley, running parallel to Ventura Boulevard in, uh, in the 134, 101 freeway. When it reaches Griffith Park, there's a gap in the mountain range that allows the river to basically cut south through the mountain range of the Santa Monica Mountains, and that's basically the spot. So right at Griffith Park here at Los Feliz, the well, it's a little bit, but I think it's a little further down. But anyways, in this area, the river makes this radical 90 degree turn and starts headed south towards downtown. And then once it reaches downtown, the flood basin basically opens up. And in a flood season, after the river passed through here, it could basically spread out and go wherever it wanted. So the river made this radical shift every year, it would basically find a new route to the sea. So at some points, actually, the river, even in the late, early 1800s, was probably occasionally dumping out uh, into the ocean near Santa Monica and Elias. But now it goes to Long Beach and sometimes it would go to San Pedro. So it makes these radical shifts every season, depending on the floods. So during the, the summer, when it's not raining, the river is basically fed from the, aqua, or from the aquifers down below and it runs along here. When it reaches this gap in the mountain range because of the granite base, the river is actually forced above ground. 
sometimes it would a lot of be running underground as a kind of underground river. When it reaches this spot, it would be forced above ground over this gap in the mountain range, the, the Glendale Narrows. So when the Army Corps of Engineers put the whole river system into concrete, they did not leave the concrete out of the river bottom here in the Glendale Narrows because they were feeling magnanimous and thought, well, maybe this would be a nice place to have a river. It was basically because the water pressure underneath the river was so high that if they paved the, the river bottom, the water would have just broke through the, con broke through the concrete. Um, so they just paved it, they just left it with stones. And as a result, rivers doing what they do and what and natural stuff moving through it, eventually this area was sort of populated with trees. Now for many years, the Army Corps of Engineers in the winter or in the fall would come through and bulldoze out all the trees, um, saying that these trees are actually like reducing the capacity of the river channel to carry water. Um, so they would knock out all the trees every year. Um, and a number of years ago, probably 10 or 15... Hmm? The ocean was starving. Yeah. About, 10, about 15 years ago, they sort of stopped that practice. Um, we've heard two different stories. Maybe Jenny's like dug into this more and knows the real deal. But um, supposedly, it's uh, one story is that Lewis McAdams, who founded the LA River, you know, tied himself to a tree with a chain and like you know protest. Um, probably the more pro the, the more believable story is that the Army Corps of Engineers had budget challenges and just sort of cut that program out and have left it out. So as a result, this area of the river is actually pretty well grown up over the past 10 or 15 years. It's one of the best spots for kind of viewing natural life in the river. Uh, about three years ago, carp started showing up in this portion of the river, which is pretty exciting. It's not the steelhead trout that's native, but there's fish in the river. There's a great blue heron right there. Yeah, lots of good heron watching. A lot of good duck watching. Another good story we'd like to tell is that uh, supposedly there's some guy who goes down to Chinatown and purchases live ducks that are destined for Chinese restaurants and he liberates them at this portion of the river where they mate with mallards and produce... WMDs. Yeah. Weird mutant ducks. <laughs> so that's, I think, kind of as much as we want to say, the big group probably at this point. Um, we talk more about Los Angeles, the founding of Los Angeles when we get to the confluence, which is five miles downstream and kind of the next five on this stretch of the one down there. So, uh, I, for my group, do we have the same timing? I want my group to be out of group. That sounds about right. right. Okay. We'll try and leave at 11. Okay, so, so we're on the same. Through. So, um, we're happy to answer questions and hang out. We'd like to give you guys maybe a half hour to walk. Is that enough? Would you like less? Would you like more? Well, what I really recommend, a really nice walk, is if, like Alan said, if you go down to that pedestrian bridge, I really, if you, if you feel comfortable, it's, it's not that hard. Just walk down this wall. There's a nice ledge. Just the one thing is, please be careful. That ledge in particular is slippery. You can go in the river, but please don't swim. Um, you know, and if you get your hands, the, the river's water is actually reasonably clean here, but you shouldn't be licking your hands and your toes until you get home and have a chance to wash them, okay? So um, if you do want to go into the river, I mean, it's fine with me. I don't know how Alan feels. If you go boulder hopping, I would just ask that you please be careful. We do not want to be in the headlines tomorrow. Okay, even, and even, even, even if we have waivers, if some of us have waivers. Um, so, um, so if you have a half hour, I think that's just enough time to go down there. So we'll be back here about 11. And that'll give us plenty of time to get to the next stop. And for my students, we're there. probably going to drop one of the stops because we're kind of extending the trip. Because our next, Jenny and her group are going to be at our next stop too. So we'll probably drop, we'll probably just go to the 6th Street Bridge. Bridge and maybe drop the cornfield. Yeah, we'll do the cornfield as a drive by because it's on the way to 6th Street and that'll be a lot of fun for you um, if we can get in. So, for my kids, we'll stay on schedule. If anybody wants any pamphlets, I'll get them right here. And also, the major freeways follow the So, the actually follow So, as I was saying, the dry season flow of the river is significantly small in, a nat in its natural state um, and sometimes even just underground. And of course, the wet season when you have flooding, a number of people were asking how high does the water go? Um, pretty much it could get up to where we're standing. That's why the riverbank is so tall. I have personally seen it in river and a flood event be at least ha up to half the walls. And one of the occasions, Jenny and I were here a number of years ago after a major flood event, um, there was debris right at the top of the 
right at the top of the slope. So we know like like debris from like the edges of the water and the banks. So the water can get very, very high in a river um, the, in a flood event. The other thing is it moves very, very fast, like close to 30 miles an hour. So in a major storm, you can move faster through Los Angeles by riding the waves of the LA River than you can driving. Um, but your chances of surviving are probably less if you're in the river than if you're driving, so don't do it. Um, but anyways, the water that's in the river right now actually is a little bit of an anomaly in the sense that it's not really natural. The water that you see coming through the river right now comes from Tillman Water Reclamation Plant, which I mentioned is up in Sepulveda Basin in the upper edges, uh, west edge of the San Fernando Valley. Tillman collects race water from throughout the San Fernando Valley. They scrape off like all the really nasty stuff. They put that in a big humongous pipe that ships it, pumps it out to Hyperion wastewater treatment plant by LAX where they deal with all that sort of stuff. But at Tillman, they basically clean out all the basic kind of water, uh, the fluid side kind of stuff, and they treat it through a whole series of processes. And then a certain amount of that water goes into their little Japanese gardens at Tillman plant, and a big chunk of it gets discharged into the LA River. So, year round. So the Tillman Water Reclamation Plant discharge is basically the reason there is a very, very steady flow of water in the LA River, particularly through year round, and particularly through the summer, which is the reason that the kind of ecology we have right here can actually flourish, that you can have fish, you can have birds, you can have this kind of vegetation, because if it wasn't for this Tillman discharge, the water level would fluctuate and would actually be quite low during the summer. And in fact, it seems like they must be discharging more water as, as the years go by because when Jenny and I first started coming here, the water levels like were generally much lower than they have been recently. Anyways, the whole ironic part of this whole story is that the water that comes through Tillman is the water that we get out of our tap, which is the water that comes from the Colorado River Aqueduct and the Owens River Aqueduct. So the water you're seeing in the LA River right now has got a little bit of Colorado River in it. And some Owens Valley. So it's part of this whole weird ecology system that we have in, in Los Angeles, this artificial way we manipulate water and where water comes from. One other kind of minor point is to sort of highlight how bizarre it is. Uh, when you get down into the South Bay, areas like Artesia are named Artesia because they had really high water pressure in Artesian wells. They used to just geyser out of the ground. Um, that actually forms a decent amount of water supply. They pump that groundwater out as they've been pumping out the groundwater. The groundwater pressure has been dropping because it's not being replenished with the flooding of the LA River. Salt water is now intruding into those groundwater aquifers. So in places like Artesia and South Bay, they actually will buy water we purchased from the Colorado River. They pump it into the ground to keep the aquifers replenished and then pump it back out. So. In Artesia, they pump groundwater, you turn on the tap, it's coming out of a well, but it's actually a Colorado River well. So it's all very weird. Um, and I want to add just a couple things, and then we need to talk about something really important, which is parking at the next site. Um, but just one is that the Tillman Reclamation Plant and the Japanese garden next to it, the, what they, the, the uh, motto in their pamphlet, their brochure, is enjoy the beauty of another culture while learning more about wastewater treatment and reuse. <laughs> okay, which has since become my motto as a writer. Um, the other thing I just want to add is that the reason that they dump all the Tillman water in is because they originally built that plant. Their plan was they were going to recycle that water. So to recycle water, you uh, you inject it into you clean it up really nicely, and instead of dumping it into the river and saying to the ocean, you inject it in the wetlands, and it seeps down and it gets nice and clean. And maybe two years later, down here, you pull it up, you clean it up, and you send it back through our toilets and our sinks. And that was that idea was killed by the phrase "toilet to tap." It became politically impossible to do at that time, and that's why they dumped most of it into the LA River. Uh, Villaraigosa and the city now have revived uh, water recycling pretty aggressively and, and my understanding is that they are pursuing now and I think people are ready for it because your generation is a lot less skeezy about things like that than our generation and um, so hopefully we'll, that's really what we need to do. I mean Orange County does it, come on. Yeah. We can do it. Um, parking. Parking. Okay, um, so our, our next stop, my students have a guide that sort of says pull oh. into the driveway. Directions for you guys. Um, 
we're with the combined groups we're probably not going to be able to pull into that driveway so it's a, it's a kind of blind driveway so we may have to go just a little bit past and park on the streets and just walk back well but but one thing on a saturday occasionally maintenance vehicles will go through so you can park on both sides of that driveway but please don't block any vehicles being able to go through the other is sometimes i have people on my tours go all the way through and park on uh, next to the arroyo on that yeah. concrete thing, which you're also welcome to treat that as a parking lot. I've never been told that we can. So um, just please don't block the entrance in case any maintenance vehicles come along. Um, does everybody in the studio okay. have directions? Yes. Let me just make sure. So was, was we can let's get going. They're all good. Okay, so we'll see you at the next. Um, the other thing that's uh, just, it's actually somewhat disappointing in some ways to be here like two years on. This is a new bridge that's been under construction for a number of years. This area used to have the most amazing display of graffiti art anywhere along the river. And um, after they finished construction, they whitewashed everything out. Um, so obviously it's starting to pick up again. Thank you. Thank you. Whitewashing it. Yeah, somebody says get original with your tag, so it's nowhere near what it used to be. Um, but it used to be we'd do tours and we'd run, e run into either taggers at this location or other classes talking about street art and the, like the design of tagging was kind of interesting. Um, so from this location, though, you go south into downtown Los Angeles, you go north up to the San Fernando Valley, or you can take the Arroyo Seco north into uh, up into Pasadena. So. And the river center where we started is just around the corner. So for many, many people, this has always been sort of ground zero of like the intersection of the river system and like the place where it all comes together. So, I'm disagreeing, like designing this tour 10 years ago. Yeah, so that's okay, my segue to Teddy. Exactly the same thing as this tour. This is great. Um, okay, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about the City of LA Master Plan. Um, you know, we have little parks, we have big parks, we have some wetlands that have gone into the ground, we have all kinds of projects all up and down the river. Um, you know, $100 million going into river restoration projects. But uh, the biggest thing so far, at least on paper, is the City of LA's master plan, which they released in 2007. The city is proposing to, uh, it has the first 32 miles of the 51 miles, so it's proposing to green up and do a bikeway along that entire 32 miles. They just finished the bikeway in the Glendale Narrows, now they're moving into the valley. And, um, and then because they don't have, it would cost exactly five gazillion dollars to do all the, uh, to do the entire river, and they don't have that. So instead what they did was to do really big projects, they chose what they call five opportunity sites, and they proposed much bigger projects there. And you students, your next stop actually downtown is one of those opportunity sites. Um, so, and I can give you if you want, like one of those master plan brochures so they can see the picture, you know, for what they want it to be. But what I want to do really is, um, show you one of the maps. Can I have a show now? Show you one of the maps that the city's uh okay. that the city used. Can I have another question? Can you see that one? Okay, so, so these are the maps that the city used to, to, to devise their master plan. Okay? These are the maps that they made. And this is actually um, uh, a place that is part of the valley stretch, so we're here. So we're actually pretty near the headwaters, okay? So I think it's really useful to look at these maps, okay? So what do we have? We've got the river, we've got a tributary, we've got a tributary, we've got a really big park here, we've got a big park here that has no connection to the river whatsoever, we've got a park here, we've got elementary school, elementary school, elementary school, elementary school, charter school, big high school right on the river, no connection to the river, okay? We've got a, the, the major commuter line in the valley, the orange line right here, in a couple blocks away. And down here we've got Ventura Boulevard just off the map, and up here just off the map we've got Sherman Way and Victory, which are other major arteries through the valley. So if you think about it, um, it really helps you imagine like what the master plan could actually achieve or what revitalizing the river. Let's say you're a kid and you live here. Right now that kid's being driven everywhere they want to go. And I've asked people who come on the tours who are from this area, and they say, yeah, we're driving our kids everywhere. So imagine if you have this greenway and bikeway, you've got a greenway here, you've got a greenway here, and the master plan proposes bike loops that go in and out from the river to the neighborhoods and to the commercial centers and to the schools and the parks. 
Um, so your kid, you can now bike to elementary school, you can bike down to the river and go here, you can get to high school, you can come down to the Orange Line when you're older, take it downtown, get into tons of trouble. Um, you can really, if you think about it, how we move through and experience Los Angeles now, revitalizing the river and creating this whole network of greenways and bikeways could really transform very dramatically the ways that we move through and experience Los Angeles. And I think it's really worth, I think these maps really help us visualize that. The one other point I'll make is that I said we have to, in order to revitalize the river, we've got to green it, we've got to clean it, we've got to take out some concrete. But the other thing we have to do is remember it. Okay? Because if we don't understand we live on a river, it's not going to really be possible to do all these other things. Right now, the river is an unmarked landscape. We've, it's essentially invisible. So people say, I say, I live in Venice. I say, I live on the beach. People say, I live in the hills. But no one, even people who live right on the river, say, I live on the river. And again, I've asked people on my tours who live literally like five yards from the river, and they never say that. So um, it's an unmarked landscape. So a lot of what the master plan is trying to do is to create a marked landscape where people would say, I live on the river. There would be this beautiful greenway that winds all the way through LA, and there would be these green streets that are marked in very specific ways, and lots of gateways and things like that. So they're trying to also turn it into a marked landscape that's a real feature of Los Angeles that people are drawn to and attracted to and understand. When you say there's no connection between the high school and the river, because they don't have any geographic connection. It's just all fenced off. There's no okay. physical. You can see that this was probably originally designed to be a riverside park before channelization. And, um, you know, I mean, Griffith Park was supposed to be a riverside park. And then it got cut off by the five. And there's this, there's actually this great little stretch of, of Griffith Park right here, you can see it, where um, a little tiny piece of Griffith Park got stranded on the other side of the river when they straightened the river there. And you can see the bend, and that's the Betty Davis uh, picnic area. It's a sweet little piece of Griffith Park that got stranded on the north side of the river. Um, comments? We've been uh, yakking I at you. I just realized as we were coming here that the name Riverside, uh -huh. you know, there you go. Oh, there's a river beside Riverside. <laughs> you guys have other comments, ideas? A question. What are the uh, future uh, implications for the river? I heard that the feds have uh, uh, defined it as a navigation river. Yeah, have you talked to your students about that, the navigability decision? Yeah. Do you want them to know about it? I don't know much about it. Uh, the navigability decision, let me do it really quickly. Basically what happened was um, the Clean Water Act, which was passed in the 1970s, um, says that it protects waters that have a connection to a navigable waterway. And the reason for doing that originally was so that they had federal jurisdiction, is my understanding. Nobody ever paid attention to that. We just assumed that the Clean Water Act covered water. Until, miraculously, the George W. Bush administration. And then there were some test cases. One of them was in the LA River watershed. Someone applied way up, up you know, in the watershed to fill in some wetlands. And the Corps ruled that, in fact, the LA River was not navigable on most of it. It was just navigable for like a couple miles in the green sections. This had potentially huge consequences for basically depriving waters all across the country and wetlands of Clean Water Act protection. So it was an enormously potentially consequential decision. The EPA, uh, there was a, a three-day expedition that uh, my friend George Wolf put together. To, they kayaked the entire length of the river to prove that it was navigable. They just kayaked right down that low flow channel, right in the middle. And um, that brought a lot of publicity to it. The EPA took over the decision from the Corps, which they had the authority to do. And several years later, just last summer, Lisa Jackson stood on the banks of Compton Creek in her shorts and sunglasses and said, we declare the LA River to be fully navigable and fully deserving of all the protections. So, so what's great about that is it gives the river legitimacy. No, nobody can say anymore that it's not a river. It's not really a river. And it also gives us access to a lot of federal money. There's a lot of federal interest in the river now. And it's just, it's a really nice kind of almost semantic boost as well as a legal boost. Does that answer your question? Or? It's not cold in a plane. Yeah. <laughs> People have been kayaking the river forever. It's just not legal. And it wasn't legal when those guys did it either. They they took the permit, which said that they could do their event, but they couldn't enter the river, even though it was a kayaking event. And um, they just plasticized it. And when the cops showed up, they handed them the permit. And they said, OK, you have a permit. <laughs> so. Other 
comments? What do you guys think? You think this is totally impossible? What do you think? Well, it requires, <laughs> you know, it requires national will. I'm sorry, what? It yes. It requires political will. Yeah. It requires political will. There's a lot going on. As soon as you get this thing, like, moving and getting more people involved, it'll eventually bring. I think the most powerful, I think, element of the city would be developers. And so yeah. once you get more people on it, then they're going to be wanting these uh, Riverside lots. So I, think, um, as, I mean, as yeah. a catalyst, so, because I'm thinking about how can the how can the river begin to maybe rezone like some of the areas around it. Because right as of now, it's all residential and it's all backyards up to it, and you get that that edge. It's not really in right. A lot of it's industrial. Yeah. Yeah, particularly um, downtown, a lot of it becomes industrial. Starting from here, it's almost all industrial. I mean, it's a mixed bag. Um, on the one hand, developers are really, really interested, and there's, uh, in association with the master plan, they've established a nonprofit real estate corporation. It's actually supposed to build public private partnerships, and it's supposed to buy land and swap land and promote that. On the other hand, you want to be very careful about gentrification. A lot of what this project is about is about giving neighborhoods the resources that they have been denied for decades and decades. And the last thing you want to do is push out the very people that this project is for. So my sense is that gentrification will inevitably happen because I don't think LA even begins to have the political will to not make it happen uh, downtown and in sort of the central city area. My own sense, and I don't know, it would be interesting to, to see what you think, Alan, is that the entire river is the 50. And people aren't going to go pouring into Maywood and Bell to buy riverfront property. You know, it's just not going to happen. Um, I don't even think into well, maybe at Water Village, it's hard to say. As it is, they might actually have to sell some of that property off because of the whole debt situation that's going on in Bell. So they're having a hard time selling it anyway. There you go. So we don't have to worry about Bell. <laughs> I mean, I think I think downtown, the only way river access is really going to happen and be, in, in a lot of cases, it's going to come through massive development. And so the area around the cornfields, which is a little bit further south, and this area is actually all subject to a new zoning plan that really anticipates a significant amount of kind of new development in the form of residential development, mixed use development, associated both with the cornfields site being the new LA His uh, State History Park, and also with revitalization along the river and train connections and all that sort of stuff. So the city, at least in certain locations, is anticipating that and it will happen. The other thing you have going on in downtown in a lot of locations is you have industrial land that is um, transitioning out. Like a lot of the industry that used to occupy those locations is sometimes leaving because it just can't expand anymore. Those properties are too small. So that industry, whole sectors of industry is moving, if not offshore than moving into the Inland Empire or out into the desert. Um, so you have that dynamic going on. Now, then, and then there was also for a long time, there was industrial land was priced really, really low compared and it, with the last housing boom. Used to be you could buy industrial land super cheap, then rezone it for housing and make a really good profit off of it. That weird inversion in the market usually commercial property is more valuable than residential property. We had a very strange inversion in the real estate market some years ago. That's probably corrected itself with the recession. Um, and so there's a lot less of people running off, buying land in industrial zone districts, thinking they're going to do luxury condos. Um, that just sort of like the market just doesn't have, can't support that, couldn't support that. So, um, But I think downtown is, yeah, definitely there's going to be a lot of gentrification along the river. And probably because of the amount of infrastructure that needs to be moved to get access to the river, it's just probably inevitable that that's going to happen. Otherwise, you'll never be able to see the river. There's a lot of infrastructure, costs a lot of dollars to move that or bridge over it or under it or whatever. And big developers have the kind of pockets and the sort of will to sort of get access to it. Get the retrench around it. <laughs> yeah. Well, South Air, they've actually talked about breaking the concrete and allowing the river to sort of break. Yeah, that's kind of the, the current sort of brainstorm or sort of to dream. To break the concrete and allow the river to sort of go into some wetlands. Oh, right. The piggyback yards. Rerouting rainwater. Well, the thing about rerouting rainwater is that 
it's that what we have to do is to start uh, capturing it everywhere. So, for example, the LA, city of LA just passed a new regulation that any new development has to capture the first three quarters inch of a rainstorm, which is a lot. Okay, so that's going to start capturing, you know. So we need, and then there's, we have these pilot programs where they've done what they call green streets and they're diverting the water, they're keeping it out of the storm sewers and instead they're diverting into swales. So we need that on every street. So it's a matter, really, it's, it can be an incremental process. And then you're still going to get flooding, but you're going to have much, much less flood water. And then you need to have diversion basins, which will be wetlands. The biggest water capture projects we have so far are a 37-acre wetland in North Long Beach that's fabulous. We'll actually go to that on my May 15th tour, for those of you who are thinking about that. Um, have you been to the get? Yeah, we should go there sometime. It's, it's really, really nice. And they're, they're actually diverting water out of the storm sewers from the neighborhood and out of the river into this wetland. So that's very, very cool. And then the county's doing a huge project in Sun Valley, which is a sort of eight mile square sub watershed in the San Fernando Valley of the LA River. And they've just opened up the first big green street on that where they've completely re-engineered the street to capture water. And they, it's a very low income area. They worked with the people on that street to give up it's in Sun Valley, in the northeast San Fernando Valley. Just look up, if you Google Elmer Avenue, it'll take you right to that project. My dad's name, Elmer. Um, but they worked with the, these low-income homeowners who agreed to like give up property because they needed to expand the street to create swales. And then they re-landscaped their properties to be native and xeriscaping. And very, very cool project. Um, those are probably the two biggest things that are going on right now. Yeah. So, um, just want to thank Alan, because you guys got twice as much today. Um, so, thank you, that was great. It's a reunion tour. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, now, for my group, we're all done, but if you guys want to either stay here, or if anybody wants to go to 6th Street, I've got about 45 minutes, which is just enough time to do that. So, you guys can let me know if you want to do that. And for my class, um, we are going to go to stop number 4, which is our next stop, which is 6th Street Bridge. So follow the directions, but instead of veering off on the stop number three, just do a drive-by and go to stop number four directly. That'll be our, our last, our next and last stop. That's the Sixth Street Bridge underpass. So that's our next destination. And I, want, I don't know if you're still driving in, but I have a Yeah. I'll... Oh, they just walk. All right. Well, the water levels.